this evening. This is the first year that we have incorporated W.E.B. Du Bois into the first year seminar, Ideas That Changed the World, and why it took so long to recognize that we have one of the finest collections in the world of his yeah. materials and named the UMass Library after him, I do not know. So it's high time that we acknowledge what we have on our own doorstep, and that scholars come here to work with and read from all over the world. So you're getting a wonderful introduction to that collection and um, from someone who is one of the great experts on Du Bois. It's my great privilege to introduce Professor Whitney Battle Baptiste, a native of the Bronx, New York, She's a scholar and activist who sees the classroom and the campus as a space to engage contemporary issues with a sensibility of the past. Her academic training is in history and historical archaeology. Her research is primarily focused on the intersection of race, gender, class, and sexuality. From Andrew Jackson's Hermitage Plantation to the early history of school segregation in Boston at the Smith School on Beacon Hill to the W.E.B. Du Bois home site. He lived in Massachusetts, in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Her ability to translate material culture and artifacts into complex interpretations of African American domestic life has made her a pioneer in her field. Her first book, Black Feminist Archaeology, published by Left Coast Press in 2011, outlined the basic tenets of black feminist thought and research for archaeologists and showed how it can be used to improve contemporary historical archaeology as a whole. She is associate professor in the UMass Department of Anthropology and serves as the director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at UMass Amherst. So join me in welcoming Professor Battle Baptiste. Shonda Pettiford for finalizing the great flyer that I'm going to frame. 
Um, and all of the instructors and the students that make up the Honors College and is making it a great place to be, right? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> so, um, I thank a lot of people in the beginning because I don't have that slide at the end that says thank you to 15,000 people. So, um, I also want to thank the men and women, or women and men, because, yeah, I like to say it that way, um, that I work with um, on a daily basis at the Du Bois Library. So, that's our new dean, brand new dean of libraries, is Simon Neem, Rob Cox, Carol Kinnear, Kim Phil, and on and on. And these folks have helped me to expand the work of the Du Bois Center and my ability to come and talk to you tonight. They have supported my efforts to learn and grow as a person that can almost, although uh, Dean Garzina said I was an expert, so now there's a little pressure, um, because it's really hard to call yourself a Du Bois scholar. He started writing at about 12 and stopped writing at 95. That's a lot, that's a lot of time, folks, to do, okay? <laughs> Work with me. Um, and I also want to acknowledge my family, um, my husband who is here, Dr. Trevor Baptiste, my children, two of the three are here. Um, and my parents who are both here, it's Charles Battle and Andrea Battle who are in the front row. So thank you, yay. Um, I start every talk by thanking and acknowledging my ancestors. The names of those I know, the names of those I hope to learn, and those of whom I will never know. For without them, I would not be here today. And before I forget, actually it was written down and I completely skipped it, my department, <laughs> the Department of Anthropology, who puts up with all kinds of stuff with me, but has been an amazing amount of support, because I also just saw my chair, Jackie Erla, in the back, and also uh, my great friend and colleague who's done a lot of ethnographic study about how Du Bois is perceived on our campus and in the library, so that's been very telling. So, now as any scholar of the moment, I'm going to begin tonight with a trigger warning. Have you heard of trigger warnings? Yes. Okay, it's a warning. I will be talking about the politics of blackness. I won't be saying African American, I will be saying black. We good, we good with that? I'm putting it out there. I'll be talking about aspects of popular culture, the Black Lives Matter movement, the politics that connect all of these things to this national moment. I will be using the term activist in the hopes that you will not see this word as scary, not as, as exclusive, or as, uh, let's just keep scary. Don't be scared of that word. I want you all to see it as positive and progressive and fluid. We all have a different way of being activists in our own lives and the world around us. And my final point of warning is about how I want us all to leave here tonight with at least a vague understanding that in the center of all of the stuff that is going on around you, that I truly believe that Du Bois is at the center. I'm gonna drop a lot on you, so that's why I'm taking my time. You understand? Pacing. It's all about timing. And I'm also from the hip hop generation, so it's about presentation and how we flow. You got that? If you were born after 85, you're not in the hip hop generation, sorry. <laughs> um, and if you were born before 1969, you're not there either. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, when I first arrived here at UMass, I was really under the impression that I knew exactly who W.E.B. Du Bois was. I thought I was pretty versed in his life, his scholarship, his form of activism, and his role in the development of a black aesthetic, a black consciousness. But I was sorely mistaken. As I stand here today, 
I can, with confidence, I can say with confidence, the grounding and the very ground that I thought I was steadily standing on in terms of knowing who Du Bois was has shifted. It's getting real dark in here. <laughs> what do I mean by this ground was shifting? I want to share with you how my identity as a scholar, a teacher, a mother, an archaeologist, a graduate of a historically black college, a, um, a daughter, a feminist, has been enhanced. All of those identities that I walk around with, and I don't choose one every morning when I leave the house, they're all together, it's called intersectionality. Have you heard the word intersectionality? All of those things have been enhanced through my relationship with the work of Dr. Du Bois. I have come to remember myself, my unapologetically black academic self. I now understand why I claim the role of scholar activist, because I can now see the dissatisfaction of race relations in this country informed the choices in, be, in what became my research. It, was in, it, was influ, it influenced how I walk through the world. But as I got to know W.E.B. in all of his complexity, I began to see him as a human being, a man grappling with the love of his country, and at the same time, the love for his people. The tireless dedication of his spirit to racial, social, and economic justice. I'm gonna say that for emphasis, just because I'm extra. Racial, social, and economic justice. Why don't we all just say it together? Racial, social, and economic justice. And if you think they're separate, hopefully you won't before you leave here because they are all tied together. And still, I have learned from reading his words how each of us has the opportunity to constantly reinvent our true selves, to find our own voices, even when our words seem disjointed from the masses, and radical in practice. I ask you right here, right now, what is your voice? What is your life's work? And I'm not just talking in an academic sense, but I'm talking about in the real world. Are you prepared for the journey of reinvention and the ability to recognize your true selves? What brings us to the college or the university? Is it the quest for knowledge? Is it the desire to use a degree for upward mobility? Is it to fulfill the dream of your family and your community? Is it to, or is it to, quote, network and pursue a deeper understanding of a college student, as in parties and making the memories that will last forever on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat? Y'all didn't even, it's, it's nothing. Y'all didn't get that. Was it too deep and then I went to, to, to a joke too quickly? <laughs> you gotta listen, because it's moving quick, okay? <laughs> because there's nothing wrong with that last part. You should also enjoy your youth and you should enjoy your time here. Maybe not everything on Instagram and Snapchat, because that doesn't go away. <laughs> I'm just, just, just saying. <laughs> and I want to say, because I want to talk back about Du Bois as a human being, Du Bois experienced some of what I'm talking about in terms of enjoying college. He very much enjoyed college, um, but he didn't have social media, and it's probably a good thing. Um, but he did go from Great Barrington, Massachusetts, to the halls of Fisk University, a historically black college in the center of Nashville, Tennessee. Not only was this his first foray into a segregated black metropolis, but it was also his first dance with the South. And it shaped him. It changed him. It transformed how he saw himself and the world around him.
And I'm going to start quoting Du Bois um, because he's a great person to quote. He's got some really great prose. And I quote, the function of the university is not simply to teach breadwinning or to finish teacher, to, to, I'm sorry, to furnish teachers for the public schools or to become a center of polite society. It is, above all, to be the organ of that fine adjustment between real life and the growing knowledge of life and an adjustment which forms that secret of civilization. He went on to talk specifically about the South and education. Quote, the South believed an educated Negro to be a dangerous Negro. And the South was not wholly wrong, for education among all kinds of men, I will always include women when I read his quotes, and women always has had and always will have an element of danger and revolution, of dissatisfaction and discontent. Nevertheless, men and women strive to know. And it's back to me now. You are all at a place where this is possible. Not the South, you're not in Nashville, because there'll be more country music. <laughs> where change can come from what you learn and what you do with that knowledge, but also the ability to see what we can all change, how we can all change our philosophies. We can all grow to become people who question the world around us, who challenge our peers, take the, the academic tasks and put them to task, and to find ways to shape the people we wish to become. Oh, I went back to In an article in the New York Times from February of this past, of, of 2016, Henry Louis Gates Jr., he's at the other, there's another university in Cambridge, it's a small little university that um, du Bois went to. Anybody know what university that is? Thank you. Um, but we have his papers. Just saying. Um, in a piece called The Black American and the Classic Divide, in this piece he discusses what Du Bois in 1903 defined as the quote, urgency of black social responsibility in his essay, The Talented Tenth. Almost 45 years after that, in 1948, Gates described the lament that this call was largely ignored. He was struck by the widening class divide in black America. In the late 40s, he felt that the black middle class had forgotten this noble calling, as he called it. He was addressing the phenomena even earlier when he wrote an amazing book called The Philadelphia Negro, which is a study of a black neighborhood in Philadelphia and published in 1899. But Harry Louis Gates posed the question, what do we make about this today? He questions the rise or the uh, uh, supposed rise of the black middle class and that prosperity on new millennials. What is the impact? He asks, what happened in light of Du Bois's prediction in 1948. And he addresses the specifics of why he thinks that this is a problem because he says that this, this class divide is, in my opinion, one of the most important and overlooked factors in the rise of Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, led by a new generation of college graduates and students. He wants us to also put away our assumptions of the stereotype that these folks that are always angry are a bunch of, quote, oversensitive, privileged, and coddled black college students complaining and whining that they don't feel safe because of building names and housemaster titles. Consider them instead the grandchildren of Du Bois's talented 10, taking their cues wittingly or unwittingly from the challenge that he and the civil rights activists of the 1960s issued 
to the black leadership. Continuing to see the threads of the past is essential in placing ourselves more firmly in the moment. What started out as an outcry, a call to consciousness of a generation wasn't only on a, on a college campus or in a classroom, it happened on social media. Gil Scott Heron said the revolution will not be televised. If you don't know what that is, please Google it. <laughs> Gil Scott Heron, the revolution will not be televised. Google is your friend. It's not your basis for knowledge, but it is your friend. <laughs> the revolution is not televised, and it's not on CNN or MSNBC or Fox, but it is on your Twitter feed. I need to check in. How are we doing? Good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, because you know we're in an age that we never know what you guys are thinking, so um, I'm just going to keep throwing it, OK? Yeah. All right. That was, a, that was slang. You all right? All right. Just, just saying. One of my hashtags is the Remy Ma of academia. Look that up, too. OK. <clears throat> I'm going to let y'all think on that for a minute. Because y'all need to know who Remy Ma is, do you? Google it. I see you. OK. OK, in a guest post, published shortly before the American Sociological Association Conference. Author of A Scholar Denied, Elgin Morris, who was last year's Du Bois birthday lecture person, um, wrote a piece titled From Du Bois to Black Lives Matter. And he explains that although the activists that began Black Lives Matter really want us to understand that it's not your grandfather's civil rights movement, this is important because there is a need to distinguish its tactics today and its philosophy from those of the 1960s. Morris states, quote, while activists have used a new social movement moniker, Black Lives Matter, to give voice to a sense that, ra that racial injustice continues to dominate the lives of people of color, I find myself wondering about the responsibilities I have as a black intellectual to speak out. It's risky to be an activist sociologist as one or as as all as excuse me <clears throat> as often as it is as not it derails careers, limits social networks, and curtails upward mobility in the profession and in the public media. But again, Du Bois illuminates He's talking about himself, my own path, declaring, and this is Du Bois' words, I am one who tells the truth and exposes evil and sees with beauty for beauty to set the world right, end quote. I concluded that one of the primary tasks of black sociologists, actually all sociologists, is to produce pointed and critical scholarship even if it's discomforting to the powers that be. A distant friend of mine, Jelani Cobb, writes, while Black Lives Matter, I'm sorry, while Black Lives Matter's in, um, insistence outsider status has allowed it to shape the dialogue surrounding race, and criminal justice in this country, it has also sparked a debate about the limits of protest, particularly of online activism. Have you ever heard of online activism? Yes, you don't have to leave your house. <laughs> the phrase Black Lives Matter was born in July of 2013 in a Facebook post by Alicia Garza, seen here in the middle, Garza wrote in her status something called a love letter to black people. And here are parts of it. This was after um, George Zimmerman was not found guilty in the murder of Trayvon Martin. The sad part is, there is a section of America who is cheering and celebrating right now. And that makes me sick to my stomach. We gotta get it together, y'all. 
Later she added, by the way, stop saying we are not surprised. That's a damn shame in itself. I continue to be surprised at how little black lives matter. And I will continue that. Stop giving up on black life. She ended with, black people, I love you. I love us. Our lives matter. And with that, her good friend Patrice Cullors, also a community activist, put a hashtag in front of what is now those three famous words, Black Lives Matter. This right now is a generation that were children, or you are a generation that were children when Hurricane Katrina hit. Many of you, if you watch it, have witnessed video after video of black women, trans women, trans men, men, boys, and girls being battered and beaten, yelled at and killed at the hands of authority. These college campuses is exactly where the proving grounds for change started. Now before I move forward, I'm gonna take you back uh, one more time because I want to talk to you about, I'm, I'm, I'm spewing a lot of black love from this podium, but I want you to understand a little bit more about why I'm saying it in relationship to Du Bois. You all got me back there? We're about to start double consciousness, okay. You all have me over there? Yeah. All right. That's like the hype man. I need a hype woman, like, by me. Um, we often hear about Du Bois and his idea of double consciousness. But I want, to, I want you to indulge me for a minute as I dig deeper, and I had to put that joke in because I'm an archeologist and I trust nothing on the surface. <laughs> Thank you. Boom, that was on. Okay. Into what this idea of, this, of the double consciousness means. When Du Bois is describing the Negro, he said this, quote, a sort of seventh son and daughter, both with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a particular sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on it on an amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his twoness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warning ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. I feel like I'm about to do like some spoken word. I'm sorry, I, just, I, got, I started feeling it. You should be excited by Du Bois every day. <laughs> From my perspective, I'm back to the present, this is also part of the reason that I see the duality as a form of separation that has risen up again, and why we continue to debate and explain the term Black Lives Matter is not a denial of all lives. But it's what we need to handle now and right now. To deny the beauty of black culture, the black soul is akin to a denial of the development of a sustainable black consciousness. Teaching through the work of Du Bois is not just an academic exercise. At least I don't think it should be. There is action behind those words and thoughts to apply and advance the methods, techniques, and functions of his work in the 21st century is how we engage all of you, young and then not so young, to value the process of being and growing and coming to see and understand your own true self. They didn't get it. I'm I'm throwing it kind of thick. You know what, hopefully maybe you walk away and it'll sink in and you'll be like, wow, I learned a lot. And even if you don't agree, you know what, that's cool. 
That really is. But maybe you might have a moment a year from now that you might switch up, or maybe after November 8th, you might think different. Just like, <laughs> I didn't say I was going to talk about it. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> Oh, sure. um, there was a great deal of activism in the life of Dr. Du Bois. Many of us have often, many of us have often heard about these, the very public debates. That's a way to put it nicely, with some of his contemporaries, like Marcus Garvey and Booker T. Washington. Raise your hands. Who has ever heard of a debate or disagreement between W. E. B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington? <laughs> Thank you. Yay, instructor. Ooh, yes. Thank you. So I want to kind of agree with another article that just came out. This is all, the reason why I wanted to use articles because they're coming out like right now. Very, very in the moment. Um, and historian Shaw, Sean Willett's, his opinion in his article called The Dialectic of Doubleness, he describes Du Bois' objection to Booker T. Washington as political. He was scornful of Washington's circumception about racial equality. But to Du Bois, they were, they were also cultural. Like Washington, Du Bois was dismayed by the debased condition of the Negro masses. Barely one generation out of slavery, but he also felt that black people's cultural, I'm sorry, but he also felt that Washington's view was tainted by a fundamental pessimism about the worth of black people's cultural resources. To Du Bois, who was all for practical knowledge, I'm sorry, to Du Bois, who was all for practical materialism, was in many ways, I'm sorry, I, do, I keep skipping. It's like I don't want to give Washington his due. I'm sorry. I'm very biased. <laughs> to Du Bois, who was all for practical knowledge, Washington's pessimism was a lie. It was a lie. The idea of elevating a Philistine materialism, translation capitalism, was in many ways a denial of black folks' soul. Capitalism is the way to lose your soul. I'm not touting Marxism. I'm just stating some things. I want some red bottom shoes too, but I realized that at the same time, there are other things that I could, that I should be focused on, right? Yeah, okay. And if you don't know what red bottoms are, Google it. <laughs> Louboutin, yes. Okay. Whew. This idea of denying and circumventing and not thinking about the soul of black folk, which was his most famous, I think most famous titled, uh, titles, is also a little bit in the lines of, of course, uh, uh, seeing ahead of time the idea of diversity. The equality in political, industrial, and social life, which modern men and women must have in order to live, is not, not to be confounded with sameness. In the, on the contrary, in our case, it is rather insistence upon the right of diversity, upon the right of a human being to be a man or a woman, even if he does not wear the same cut of vest, the same curl of hair, or the same color of skin. Human, human equality does not even entail, as it, as it is sometimes said, absolute equality of opportunity, for certainly the natural inequalities of inherent genius and varying gifts make this a dubious phrase. And he's talking about if we're all given the same opportunities, but understand there's a value in not being the same. There's a value in understanding diversity actually helps everyone in the room. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Young people are lifting their voices in ways that for many of us may seem confusing. I'm talking about the not so young people. For me, they also feel liberating. I can teach a course on slavery, race and the museum, archeology, span or one of my more popular ones, gender and hip hop culture, 
and use every social media platform I can get my hands on to translate, to help my students to translate the deeper meanings of historical connections of everything you see around you. And this is possible because there is nothing new under the sun. Okay, maybe the not so young people understood that. <laughs> So let's think about it. A Super Bowl and the Grammy Awards, right? Beyonce and Kendrick Lamar. The final for my gender and hip hop class was a deep critical analysis of the Korea poem, Lemonade. You know about Lemonade? It's by this artist named Beyonce. <laughs> I guess if y'all were under a rock, you would not know that. But that was the final, and it was critical. It really was. But then things are happening that should cause you to understand that there is a slow and not so subtle revolution happening in this country. And it's why we are such at odds, constantly separating ourselves by a dichotomy that is really a fiction, okay? Because it's a little scary. It's a little scary to some. So there was a weekend a couple of weeks ago that this album came out by Beyonce's younger sister, Solange. And it was called A Seat at the Table. Google that. It's not just her album title. It's actually talking about the rights of black folk way back. James Baldwin. <laughs> Google him, James Baldwin. He taught at the W.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies right here at UMass for a while. If you didn't know that, look that up too. But Solange's album was blackness. With songs like Don't Touch My Hair. And here's the beginning of the lyrics. I'm just gonna throw this at you because I believe in music, I believe in lyrics, I believe in everyone. Don't touch my hair when it's the feelings I wear. And I'm not gonna sing it because I cannot sing. Don't touch my soul when it's the rhythm I know. Don't touch my crown. They say the wisdom I found. Don't touch what's there when it's feelings I wear. They don't understand what it means to be me, where we chose to go, where we've been to know. This album with songs like, you have every right to be mad. The same weekend, Netflix premieres Marvel's Luke Cage, a superhero who is bulletproof, who wears a hoodie. If you don't think that there's a connection between that, does, do you know when Falcon and Luke Cage and Black Panther arrived on the scene in Marvel? It was in the late 60s and the 70s. Why have they reemerged? Falcon all of a sudden is in Captain America. Guess what? He is Captain America. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> he's from Harlem. Luke Cage technically is from the South, but he's doing his thing in Harlem. A bulletproof person who is black who wears a hoodie. Please think about that. Coming out the same weekend as Solange, his album. That was really extra, extra black. These are things that are happening in our nation, but these are not things that are separate from Du Bois, and I'm going to connect everything. I don't, I've been throwing Du Bois everywhere because he fits everywhere. Every morning you should wake up to a Du Bois quote. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna go on, because I gave you a trigger warning, so it's all, it's, it's all good. When a San Francisco 49er named Colin Kaepernick takes a knee during playing the national anthem. There's a whole lot of problems with that. There's a whole lot of people who are angry and upset because for the first time, people are actually taking actions and it's making a lot of folks in this country mad. 
You take a knee when a player goes down. You take a knee because everything stops. All over this country, young people, not NFL players as much, but young people are taking knees, getting their seasons canceled, getting suspended. Now I want you to look at this slide because it says a lot about where we are right now. This is from a really short video that was on social, uh, social media on dot, dot mic, M-I-C. 42% of white young, white young white Americans, well, okay, that was a typo. Erase one of those. Um, of white, young, young white Americans don't support Black Lives Matter. But now I wanna take you back to 1964. 63% of Americans said civil rights leaders pushed too fast. 58% said civil rights activists were violent. Have you heard that with Black Lives Matter? I know I have. 58% said that they hurt their own cause. This is a quote from Bill O'Reilly, who has a show on some channel. He says that Dr. King would not participate in Black Lives Matter protests because he was a pacifist. And the video ended with this line, public opinion is rarely on the side on the right side of history. Now I want to take you real quick back to Great Barrington, the birthplace of W.B. Du Bois. And this is something that happened. It's, and this is a quote from the Berkshire Eagle. It has been a tumultuous week in the small high school of 550 students on September 23rd, a player on the high school, I'm sorry, a player on the high school football team took a knee during the national anthem as part of a national protest movement against police killings of African Americans over the past few years. As journalists, I think that's a little, you know, that's more, it's more than that, right? That next Monday, that student was threatened by another high school student who threatened to, quote, lynch him, and to, quote, use his body for target practice. This young man who did this, I know him well, and I'm not gonna show his picture. I know him well because he was, he is, he was among several high school students from the Pittsfield, Berkshire area that came to participate in a, in a Du Bois Center program called Project, well, it was part of another organization in the Berkshire County called Project Elevate. He decided to take action. He was the only person that knelt. Now, every game, he has at least 20 to 30 community members coming from all over Pittsfield and Berkshire County, getting out of the stands to kneel with him because his mother refuses to let the threat stop her son from something that he believes in. He learned it from talking through and talking about Du Bois, believe it or not. And it's ironic because Monument Mountain High, where this happened, over 20 years ago there was a controversy over naming. There were three schools that needed to be named the elementary school, a middle school, and a high school. There was a big debate, and activists uh, um, came to the, the, the idea of let's name one of these schools after Du Bois. No happening. Du Bois is a communist. Du Bois was against America. Du Bois is this. Du Bois is that. None of those schools got the name Du Bois. Some people have changed the way they feel about Du Bois and Great Barrington, but some people who are black and live in the Berkshires say that their experiences have not. Jade Sola James is a high school student from Miss Hall's school, and she wrote about the choice of taking a knee in solidarity with athletes. From my perspective, I am here to express that I do not denounce the United States of America. I am blessed with the opportunities I have thanks to my residents here, as is this young man. 
However, I do choose to denounce the marginalization of people of color in these United States, police brutality, systemic racism, and all that contributes to the death and destruction of my race. Expressing these, expression of these feelings, this constant pain through this, I mean, sorry, the constant pain varies in form. My expression of my feelings, my burning desire to free myself of insecurity, my need to be black and unafraid, and my love of my culture is expressed through this writing. If I played football, I would be kneeling too. She wrote that for her friend, and it was published in the Berkshire Eagle. Today, we are facing an election, a time when many of us are looking on in amazement. Some of us are, some of us are supporting either side, that's your business. But again, what is your practice? How will your actions bring about the change you want for our nation, our communities, our families, and our world? Again, and I was thinking about this moment, I thought of two very poignant quotes from Du Bois. The first about the in insistence to continually raise this voice. <clears throat> Quote, they do not expect that the free right to vote, to enjoy civic rights, and to be educated will come in a moment. They do not expect to see the bias and prejudices of years disappear at the blast of a trumpet, but they are absolutely certain that the way for a people to gain their reasonable rights is not, to voluntar not by voluntarily throwing them away and insisting that they do not want them. The, that the way for a people to gain respect is to continually, is not by continually belittling and ridiculing themselves, that on the contrary, Negroes must insist continually in season and out of season that voting is necessary to modern man and womanhood. That color discrimination is barbarism, and that black boys and girls need education as well as white boys and white girls. And on the other hand, we all might not be happy with our choices. Don't take a break. Go vote, please. The, and, um, you know, there's a quote. I have another quote. It's coming to a close. You ready? Right. Ready. 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 Yeah. Woo. <laughs> Energy. The power of the ballot we need in sheer self-defense. Else what shall we else what shall save us from a second slavery? Freedom too, the long sought, we will seek. The freedom of life and limb, the freedom to work and think, the freedom to love and aspire, work, culture, liberty. All these we need, not singly, but together. Not successively, but together. Each growing and aiding each other and all striving toward that vaster ideal that swims before the Negro people, the ideal of human brotherhood and sisterhood gained through the unifying ideal of race, the idea of fostering and developing the traits and talents of the Negro not in oppression or opposition to or contempt for other races, but rather in large conformity to the greater ideals of the American Republic, in order that someday on American soil, two world races may give each other, may give to each those characteristics both so sadly lack. And I know it's just not black and white. We have lots of other folks, but I hate to tell you this country was built on black and white. It's hard. You ever hear that? Everything is a dichotomy. It's black or white, man or woman. We know that's not true. I just wanted to show that. So, my work at the W.B. Du Bois Center has expanded the ability to put words and thoughts into action. My hopes are to create a space where we can all find the opportunity to constantly reinvent our true selves, to find our own voices even when our words seem disjointed from the masses and radical in practice. 
So I ask you again, as I asked you at the beginning, what is your voice? How are you going to use the work and words of W.B. Du Bois in your courses, in your life, in different aspects of argument? What is your life's work, and not just in the academic sense? Are you prepared for the journey of reinvention and the ability to recognize your true selves? Think critically about what brings you to this place called UMass Amherst. And for all of us, don't be afraid of Google or Facebook or Twitter or those other platforms, but don't limit yourself to being online entities that forget to connect life, the keyboard, and the scholarship. And all of that said, I think the boys would definitely agree with me. Show us some pictures. Um, I want you to know that Du Bois is present. Du Bois is in our lives. Du Bois is giving life to black scholars, white scholars, Latino and Lat Latinx scholars, scholars from Asia, scholars from Germany, scholars from all over the world. That library is huge. That library was built, it was called the, the Tower Library, or the Library Tower. It took protest, it took student involvement to actually name that library Du Bois. It didn't happen until 1994. And it was based on the fact that students wanted that to be named. It's the tallest building on this campus. That's extremely radical. That's an action that was not just administration, that was students. Protest has lived on this campus. Learn that the actions, the things you see around you that you're taking granted, a lot of it was fought for by students that look like all of you in this audience. I'm imploring you and I'm asking you to understand that Du Bois is present. Du Bois is at the center of this moment. Whether you agree with Black Lives Matter, whether you need to be convinced to leave All Lives Matter behind, you should. It's okay, I'll talk about you after, with, I'll talk about you, I'll talk about with you if you need to. Please understand that it's not just some words, it's not just a book. It is right now. Du Bois matters today, you matter today. I wanna thank you for tonight. Peace, thank you for listening, thank you for paying attention.